Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. How many of you guys feel rested up? Yes, sir. Man, no hands. Yes, okay. That's why we're doing this message then. Uh, but there are seasons in your life that you find yourself in the Lord that you find yourself, man, it's just, it's a beautiful place of peace. You feel like, man, there's just, God is doing good. Our family's great. We're in a great season uh, right now and things are looking just beautiful. Or you just just peaceful waters. He's leading you beside, you know, the green pastures and, you know, provisions being made. New doors are opening up, new beginnings. And it's just a great season. Anybody ever been there? If you know the Lord, you, you've been there. Because he, the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. And so he's a good God. He cares for his people. He always has, always will to the very end. It says that he loved them to the very end. And so there are also times, though, in life here on this earth that we feel the exact opposite. Where we feel like, man, we just got it. We got to get away from here because we need some rest. I'm tired of these kids. I'm tired of these cows. You're not calling your kids cows. Like that's, in, that's if you're a rancher or something. I'm tired of feet. I'm tired of the routine. I'm tired of working. And man, I just got to get away. Anybody ever felt that way? We just need, man, I just got to get away. And you know, you, we just had our grandkids. And after two, three days of, of them, it's like, okay, we need a vacation. We need a break to just get away. And so you find yourself in those moments when, um, when it's pressing like that. And then all of a sudden you find yourself spiritually drained. Or you're going towards, you know, your faith starts drifting a little bit. Uh, Or you find yourself out of church for a long time, long time, and and you're just getting little pieces of God here and there as you read or as you look at a sign as you're driving down the road. And next thing you know, you're depleted on the inside. And you feel like a a steak that's been overcooked. It's just dry and it doesn't taste good in life. Anybody ever been there? What do you do when you are spiritually... um, you're dry and on the inside and you feel like, you know, you need, you need something refreshed. What do you do? Wake up, sleeper. It's time to rest in God. It's time to uh, understand that God is your rest in those moments. Amen. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 14th verse. This is where we're getting our passage of scripture's foundation for the series. It says, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine his light upon you. And that's what we believe that is going to happen this morning. Now, I have to tell you something this morning for all of you guys. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Okay, good. Here's a word that I know the Lord gave me for you. I know without a shadow of a doubt. Some of you are in turmoil. Some of us are struggling. Some of us are having a hard time in our lives. Some of us want to throw in the towel of surrender. And we just want to give up. Some of us are not sure whether or not you chose the right mate and you're only 14. (laughs) Some of you guys are just, you know, they're having a hard time. Here's the word for the Lord, from the Lord to you. I am your rest. I am your rest. He is your rest. He's not only your strength. He's not only your energy. He's not only your power. He's not only your grace. Today, he's your rest. He's your rest, and I need you to rest in him. Psalms 94 says that he will give you rest from the days of adversity. Another scripture, that says, Jesus, you remember this one. It says, come to me. When he was looking over the multitudes, he saw that they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And he says, come to me, all who are weary, all who are struggling in life. I'll give you rest. Learn from me. I'll give you rest for your soul. You don't have to be in emotional torment. You don't have to be struggling with your mind like that. You don't have to be so close to get to the mental hospital. You don't need this breakdown. I am your rest. Psalms 127 says, it's vain for us to rise up early in the morning and then work all day long and then come way late at night and we're going to eat the bread of anxiety. Jesus said, I am your rest in those moments. I give my beloved sleep. You don't have to be night after night feeling like, man, I can't get any sleep because all this stuff's struggling in your own head. He says, he gives his beloved rest. First Peter 5, we just mentioned it a minute ago. He goes, cast all your cares upon him because he is your rest. Isaiah 26 says, he will keep in perfect peace when your mind is stayed upon him. He is your rest. And let that be uh, something that just stays inside of your soul. Are you tired? Are you weary? Just like Isaiah says, I see the young man stumble and they fall. But those who learn to rest in me, he'll renew your strength. 
He'll make you soar on wings like eagles. He'll make you run again. No longer will you grow weary. You walk and you'll not faint because God is your rest. Amen. That's who your father is. So if you get anything out of today's message, I want you to walk out of here and just let that sink into your spirit and say, you know what, God, you are my rest. And I believe that. It doesn't matter what she says. It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter the report that I'm reading. He is your rest and I rest in you. Rest is a form of trust. Faith is a rest. You know, I had an interesting comment this last week. I was talking to the staff, because after Easter, you get depleted. And so we were sitting there just laying down on these rugs and talking about different passages of Scripture. And uh, I talked about, you know, how you, we need to rest and replete ourselves because we still got, you know, it's just March or April or whatever, and we still got a long ways to go. And so they were talking about different things, um, what they do to rest and stuff. But one of the comments that I was really, really surprised, I've never heard this before, was um, one of the staff members said, he goes, I, I don't like to rest because I feel vulnerable. I feel afraid because if, if I'm sleeping, I don't know who's going to be knocking at the door or who's coming in or if my kids are jeopardized, you know, whatever. So they felt fear in a sense in moments of, so they don't rest a whole lot. And I don't know about you, but I don't ever have those feelings. I'm like, I'm going to rest. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm done for the day. Anybody can come in. That's fine. I'm, you, can, you can hit me or whatever. I'm not going to feel it. I'm resting. But I thought it was very, very interesting how individuals, and maybe there's more people like that. I just never had that idea that people can't rest because of all the anxiety and all the stuff, the potential stuff that can take place. The stuff the enemy throws in, and you know, you get a little cut on your finger, next thing you know, oh man, I'm going to get cancer, and that's going to turn into this, and next thing you know, you're dying already. You put yourself in a, in a coffin. That's the way the enemy works, isn't it? But I'm telling you, man, God has a rest for you. He has a rest for the people of God. And this is a lesson that I have learned in my life as a young child of God walking with the Lord. It's one of the first things that God wants to do to make sure that this idea is sealed in your spirit, sealed in your heart, that he is your rest, that he'll take care of the situations that you think um, you can take care of or manhandle your own self. A lot of times when we get our hands in it, man, things get muddy and it's not good, is it? You try to fix a, your car? You ever try to do that when you don't know what the heck you're doing? That's dumb, isn't it? But I don't know why we keep doing it. The same is true in our walk with God. We have the man who is going to lead us and guide us, and he's given us his spirit, but we try to do it our own way, in our own understanding. And we're leaning upon, you know, the arm of the flesh more than the rest in God. Amen. And so he wants us to switch that around. So I want to look at a passage of scripture this morning. It's a story real quick that I want to look at. And just real quickly, let me give you the background. So the disciples was with Jesus. They were walking with him, talking with him, you know, for years. But this particular day, the Lord had just given them authority to go out and minister his word. It says that he gave, gave them power over unclean spirits. So they went out two by two. They were ministering God's word and power and life. And uh, people were getting ministered to. People were getting, um, uh, you know, demons were coming out. And people were getting free in all aspects of life. And they were all excited. They were all pumped up. It's like, yeah, man. They came back and brought a report. And Jesus right away, because there, anytime you minister and there's impact in people's lives, there's a potential to, to walk in pride. You know what I did? I laid hands on her and blah, blah, blah. Like, you didn't do anything, right? You didn't do anything. You think you did something. And so there's a, so Jesus says, he goes, hey, don't, don't rejoice that all this took place through your hands. If rejoice, you rejoice in this, that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, that I've given you an opportunity to go in my name and minister my word. And so right afterwards, um, that situation, so when you're out ministering, you get depleted on the inside. So these disciples, they were a little bit um, tired. And so Jesus notices that and he goes, hey, let us go to this other place because I want to give you a place. You need to rest for a little while. And so they went to this other place to go rest. And um, guess what happens? Rather than resting, multitudes start following them. And so next thing you know, you got 5,000 people in this area where they're supposed to be resting with Jesus. 
You ever go to a place and it's like, you know what, babe, let's just go to this restaurant. It's way out here. I went out to a place in New Braunfels to go on, in a camp uh, to go walk a hike. I'm like, there's nobody out here. Let's just go walk this place. And I'm walking in the middle of that woods. Pastor Marcus. I'm like, who in the world? What is going on here? So they go out there to this place to go rest with Jesus. 5,000 people show up. Jesus said, hey, you got to go feed him now. And so the miracles begin to take place through their hands again. And they're all excited. They're all pumped up. Man, did you see that? Five loaves came out of this hand. Well, I don't know how it all happened, but still, they were all pumped up. And 5,000 people were ministered to when they were supposed to be resting. Anybody ever been there? No? <clears throat> so, so all of a sudden, they're, they're depleted, and they're, they're, the energy is sapped. And, and to top it all off, not only was it the, the greatest all-you-can-eat buffet in the history of mankind, what was real hurtful in the back of their hearts and their heads was that morning, they had just heard that their best friend, John the Baptist, had gotten beheaded. And I don't know about you, but when you have a friend or a cousin, someone that's close to you, gets shot, gets killed, is put in a grave, that's, it's hurtful, isn't it? It stings a little bit. And so not only were they carrying the energy that was being lost, they also had a little bit of grief, a little bit of concern going on. Because they probably were thinking, like I'm thinking right now, man, John the Baptist was a stud. The dude was eating locusts and honey, declaring his name, and the result of doing that is you get beheaded. And now Jesus is telling me to do something similar. I'm like, oh, heck, in Jesus' name. So they were sapped with energy. And so immediately after they feed the 5,000, not only are they drained physically, emotionally, um, uh, every aspect, they're about to get drained potentially spiritually as well. Because immediately, the scripture says, Jesus tells them, get inside the boat and go to the other side. And so they began to obey. Now, the reason why, here's just my thought behind this. You can, you can look it up and look at it yourself. But I think one of the reasons why Jesus tells them to immediately get in this boat is because, again, the, uh, the opportunity to become proud because of the works that they were being done in the Lord's name was right there. Because the scripture says that the, that the, that the crowd was trying to put them in a place of authority. They were trying to make them kings. And how many of you guys know there's only one king? And Jesus is trying to protect them. He goes, hey, away from that pride. He goes, immediately get in this boat, get over to the other side. And so they began to go on to the other side. And a, obviously a storm comes in. And he puts them in a place of dependence again one more time. And Jesus comes in in the middle of the night. Now, here's this passage right here. Um, in the middle, from, from their journey, from the, from the time they left, it's an eight-mile trip over to the other side. And right in the middle of that journey, in the fourth mile or so, the scripture says that Jesus comes in the fourth watch. And he comes to them, but they didn't recognize him. So let me, let me look at this passage right quick, and then uh, we'll make some notes, and then we'll release you guys here in a few minutes. Is that all right? It's Mark 6, uh, 46 to 52. It says, when he sent them away, he departs to the mountain to pray. He sends them away to go cross over to the other side of the lake, correct? And then Jesus goes to the mountain to go pray. Now, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at the rowing, for the wind was against him. So think about it. He sends him out into the boat. Jesus goes out to a mountain, and he's praying. And it says that he can see them where he's praying. He sees them straining, just like he sees you straining. He sees you in that place of unrest right now. And it says he sees them straining there in the middle of the sea. And the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus comes to them. Now I don't know about you, but have you ever studied the fourth watch? That's from like three, in the, three o'clock in the morning to about six o'clock in the morning. How many guys are up at three o'clock in the morning to six in the morning? A few of you guys are. Most of y'all should be asleep. But a great deliverance takes place on the fourth watch. As a matter of fact, if you study scripture, another great deliverance took place in the fourth watch. It was when God was delivering the children of Israel out of Pharaoh's hand, out of slavery. That deliverance took place in the fourth watch. 
So great deliverance takes place. You might be in the fourth watch of the night. You might feel like you're covered in unrest and you don't know what to do. You don't know how to make the next decision in your family, in your household, in your business or whatever it is. But I want you to know you're in the perfect place because in the fourth watch, he comes to you. Just like he came to the disciples and the great deliverance will take place. So Jesus comes, it says, walking on the sea and they would have passed them by. And then all of a sudden when they saw him in that era, they thought it was a ghost. And they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talks to them and says to them, be of good cheer, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he goes into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed beyond themselves, uh, beyond measure, and they were marveled. And then they understood, or they didn't understand about the loaves because of the heart was hardened. So I need you to see this picture, okay? Because this picture, and I love this passage of scripture. And one day... I want someone who's an artist, if y'all can help me paint that picture like I see it. I need you to see this though this morning, okay? Because I see not only the disciples back then, but I see the truth of us as disciples taking place right now. I need you to see that. I need you to see what takes place. So Jesus said that he tells the disciples to go and get into the boat. Danny, can you help me out? Just pick, pick a couple of your disciple friends, bro, and come over here. Your, your son, Ivan, come over here, Ivan. No, 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 we'll go down here. I, I need y'all, I need y'all to go to the other side. Okay, man, you gonna do it by yourself? Okay, go with the disciples. That's Peter, yeah, Peter's on his own. He, gets, he has a knife, he's got a knife in his pocket and everything. Everybody else is following him. He goes, I need you to go on to the other side. This is what Jesus is saying, right? Here's the picture. And so all of a sudden, at least if y'all could all get in that boat, it'd be great. <laughs> or just put your foot in there. Yeah. I don't know why all the disciples are Mexican, but that's okay. <laughs> it's because Jesus was a Mexican. I know that. I know that. <laughs> so the scripture says that while they're on the other side or going towards the other side, where he says, listen, you, I'm sending you on a mission. You need to get to the other side. And it says, Jesus went to the mountain to go pray, Right? And so there he is praying on the mountain. This is my ladder mountain. And it says right here that Jesus was there up on the mountain. Are you going to carry me? Catch me? If I fall, just pick me up, okay? It says that he was praying to the Father from this place. And it says that he could see the disciples straining at the rowing. In other words, the wind started coming. And it started, you know, blowing them backwards. So they're just, you know, they're huffing and they're puffing. And all of a sudden they could, they could just start coming back if they quit. But he sees them straining at the rowing. Can you guys strain a little bit? There you go. <laughs> and he watches them and he sees them. And so what does he do? In the fourth watch of the night, you know, here you are, three in the morning, six in the morning. It says that Jesus goes to them. Just like he, he goes to you. Some of you guys are on a mission. He sent you on a mission to accomplish a mission here on this earth. He's given you a mandate to get over to the other side. I'm going to meet you on this other side. And you find yourself obeying Jesus right now. But right in the middle of your journey, there's opposition. Right in the middle of your journey, there's a possible setback. There are people telling you things that you shouldn't do that. That's stupid. You shouldn't date her. You shouldn't marry her. She's a crazy woman. You know, whatever it is, there's opposition going on, but he's telling you, get to the other side and you need to obey. Amen. Amen. And here you are in the middle of the struggle. You're straining and Jesus sees you just like he saw the disciples. I want you to know that he sees you where you're at right now. Amen. Okay. And, and guess what? Guess what happened? He, he's going to do the same thing that he did to the disciples. It says that he comes to them. Amen. He comes to them. Obviously, they were a little concerned because they thought he was just a ghost. And it says he would have passed him by. You know, but all of a sudden he said, hey, here I am. And the scripture says that Jesus gets into the boat. So they could have easily said, hey, can you push me? Push me off. You're a ghost, you know. I don't understand. I don't know who you are. I don't identify with you. Jesus comes in many different forms. Right. Amen. Sometimes through people that you don't even like. Amen. Wow. Good. And you shrug that off. <laughs> Because you don't like the individual that's coming to you on his behalf. Amen. Or you don't like the words that they're telling you because they're words of truth. 
So he comes in, and the beautiful thing, it says that they let him in the boat, and then he gets into the boat, and immediately when he gets into the boat, everything ceases. And they get to the other place. Amen? Amen. You guys can go sit down. So you find yourself right here in this place right now, friends, and this is why you're here in this church today. You know, you weren't supposed to be here, but somebody invited you to church because they promised you lunch. But I'm telling you that you're here for this very reason, that he sees your situation. He sees your straining. He sees the stress. He sees the storm that you're in. But I want you to see something also, that just like he came to the disciples, he's coming to you. He's coming to you in your life. And if you allow him and don't disregard him, let him get into the boat. Let him come into the boat because he's saying, wake up, sleeper. I am your rest. Wake up, sleeper. I am your healer. Wake up, sleeper. I am your confidence. I am your provision. I am everything that you could ever think or ask. Amen? That's one of the main lessons uh, he taught me early on in my walk with Jesus. When I was at Raymond Bible Training Center in Oklahoma, I used to uh, wake up at, you know, early in the morning. I'd go to Bible school from 9 o'clock in the morning till noon, get a little lunch, go to work at 2 o'clock. I used to work at a St. John's hospital doing some janitorial stuff, cleaning, you know, mopping floors and stuff. And then I'd, I'd, I'd come home at 2 in the morning, and then at 3 in the morning I'd go to sleep, and then at 7 in the morning I'd wake up, take my girls to school, and the routine kept on going. And so we did that for a couple years in Bible school. And every time I would get my girls and I'd take them to elementary school, I would drive them in my car. And before they would get out of the car, I would let the girls know. He goes, hey, girls, uh, you do your best and God will do the rest. Next day, hey, girls, I know, Dad, I'll do my best and God will do the rest. They're like, whatever. I don't even know what you're talking about, but okay. And I would share that with them. You can ask them. I would share that with them all the time. Then all of a sudden, I'd come into the classroom one day, and the Spirit of the Lord corrects me. He goes, you're teaching them wrong. He goes, what do you mean I'm teaching them wrong? He goes, you're teaching them wrong. Here's how you need to teach this. I've done my best. You enter into my rest. And all of a sudden, I got it. The emphasis is not on my moving, my works, my getting involved in this, even though I have to be in the middle of it. But the emphasis is in resting in what God's already done. That's exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus came, he redeemed our life from destruction. And he broke every habit. We, do, we're, we have deliverance because of him. He did the work. We're to rest in the work that Jesus did on our behalf. That's why when God looks at you, he doesn't look at you based upon what you did last night or what took place right before the parking lot. God looks at you based upon what Jesus did on that cross when they, he was buried, when they, he was raised from the dead. Because the reality of it is this. Listen, the reality of it is this. Listen, guys, you got to get this. When he died on that cross, you were crucified with him. We put our sin, put him on that cross. It says not only were we crucified with him, we died with him. But also, we were raised with him. And because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, his body, which is us, he's the head, we're the body, we're also seated at the right hand of the Father, positionally in the place of authority, and so now we're in this place, victorious in him, because of what Jesus did. Now, this truth has been in Scripture since Genesis. If you think about Genesis, God creates all the heavens and all the earth in how many days? In the first six days, in six days he did that, right? In other words, he, he works and he creates everything that's beautiful, the environment's lovely, and then he creates man on the what day? Sixth day. So all of a sudden that picture's right there also. God did the work, now he places man in there to enjoy in the work that God's already done. Same truth. I've done my best, creation's here, now you enter in and enjoy my re- the rest. Do you get that? Yes. If you go a little bit further, think about this. So he creates the, the earth in six days, and then all of a sudden he creates man on the evening of the sixth day. Man is created. So in the evening, as a matter of fact, he puts Adam to sleep. 
Wake up sleeper. He puts Adam to sleep. Adam rests. And in the place of rest, God creates a woman for him. So here's just a, a note for you gentlemen who are single. You'll get the one that God wants you to have when you learn how to rest in him first. You don't have to get outside of his boundaries to go and find that cute little gal that's got a demon inside. Because <laughs> the scripture says that after Adam went to sleep, he creates woman out of the rib and he brings her to him. Do you think God can do that today? Yes. Rest. God can do that. You don't have to go outside and go around fishing like, man, I'm going to grab me something out there. I'm getting old. I'm 29 years old. I'm 37 years old and I ain't got one yet. Maybe it's my weight. You know? It doesn't matter. Anyways, if you rest in God, he'll bring who you need to have in the right season at the right time of your life. But here's my point. That wasn't even the point. The point is this. Is that when he created Adam and Eve, he creates them at the end of the sixth day. And then all of a sudden, they wake up the next morning, and they're like, okay, what do, we, what do we do now? I love this gal that you brought me. I love her. What are we supposed to do now? Well, that next morning is day seven, which is actually the day of rest. And so what God is trying to teach them and try to teach us is that, listen, your enjoyment is not going to come from you doing stuff. The first day he actually had his wife and, and Adam together, he, he, he had them not work, he had them just sit there and enjoy and rest in God's presence. And then afterwards, afterwards it, started, started, it started happening. So the truth is that God's done his best and you and I need to learn how to enjoy in that rest. Does that make sense or not? And so, so many times we get in the way in our lives. Isn't that the truth? Man, we just sit there. He goes, hey, rest in me. I am your wisdom. I am your strength. I am your all in all. I am your passion. I am your, your rest in me. Just rest in me. Just trust me. Because resting is a form of faith. Faith is a rest. Before your relationships, rest in me. Before your marriage, rely upon me. Before your addictions, hold on to me. Before your children, hold on to me. Before your hurt and your habits, let me be your rest. Before anything else, any of your business plan, your business meeting, or whatever else you're facing, don't sacrifice this promised land, this rest that I have for you at the expense of you being uh, so wound up inside that you want to get involved in this. So the, the, the thing that I want to ask you to do this week is, is what's one thing that you can do this week to free your time and free your calendar, your schedule of a little bit more rest where you're just focusing your attention on him? Maybe it's that five or 10 minutes in the morning where you put him first in your life. The scripture says, seek him first and all these things that we're so concerned about will be added to you, amen? Enjoy God's work. He did all the work you enjoy the work that he did for you. Rest in him. We do that as well. But there are seasons in life where you just need to pause and just let God fill you and refresh you and bless you. It's called a Sabbath, a spiritual Sabbath. Let him fill you. And one day of doing that every week will take care of years of you trying to do things in life. If you learn how to allow God to be your rest. Our souls long for something greater. True rest doesn't come from a can. True rest doesn't come from a counterfeit. It doesn't come from a copy. True rest comes from the king who reigns, from a shepherd who cares, from a savior who saves. Jesus Christ, he is your rest. Trust him. Amen. Let's pray. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.